So there's two bits of information today. The first bit of information was the Riot fighting game got getting announced and everything. The second news and information is this lovely article came out by Infilament. Now you guys might be familiar with Infilament. He made this guide, the ki.info.net, which is the greatest resource for a fighting game ever created. Ever. So today, Infilament wrote another blog post. The first one was about bugs in fighting games and how they work. Stuff like the Guile Handcuff glitch, stuff like this uh, flying bug in Street Fighter Cross Tekken, and then this bug, the Quicksilver glitch. Then, the second guide was written, Netcode. Now this is an explanation of how delay-based and rollback netcode works for fighting games. A lot of people have asked in the chat room how netcode works, why one is better than the other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's been lots of discussions about both. And a lot of people in my chat room have asked questions about rollback, have asked questions about delay. There's been a lot of people assuming or saying things about rollback that's maybe not correct. And before this, a lot of the times when people would ask about rollback, what would we do, chat room? We would point them to the GDC talks. You know, there's sort of a resource here, there's sort of a resource there. Until now, I don't think there was a good place to just go check out information on rollback netcode. So this is an excellent uh, resource for how it works. If you haven't read this article, you should definitely read this article. It's crazy to, to me because I, I can't believe that this article has never been written before and it's never been as in-depth as it is already. So it starts and it's a discussion about netcode and how netcode is simply a method for two or more computers trying to play the same game to talk to each other over the internet. Networks are constantly unstable. This is bolded for a reason. This is something you have to remember about netcode in general. No matter how good your internet connection is, no matter how close you live to somebody, there will always be moments of instability in connections. There's not a lot of easy to follow explanations for what exactly rollback is and how it works. And it works out that Symbio dropped the big two months. Thanks very much. The problem with most explanations of rollback is that they look like this. I think this is cool. And this is an explanation of how rollback works. But when I point you guys at these things, these graphs and this text, you, you probably don't have the exact idea of how it works. And it works out that young Leroy dropped the big five months. Does this look clear to you guys? Do you understand how these fucking hieroglyphics work? These are uh, complicated to look at if you don't really understand how netcode works. So this next section gets into why you should care about rollback netcode. And uh, obviously the answer is because playing online is no longer the future, but the present. And to be honest with you, it's the truth, right? Most of us play fighting games online. Getting the privilege to play fighting games offline is actually not that common. I don't get to play fi offline fighting games as much as I want, and I live in a place with a local scene, and I have friends that are all fighting game fans. Having great netcode online is so important. And uh, I think this GIF from the CPT event shows a good example of how this netcode is bad. It's from that tweet we showed with Johnny playing online from John Takuchi's uh, Twitter. I won't get you too deep into that, but what we're looking at here, it says in fighting games, time is measured in a unit called a frame. Just to make the discussion easier, we'll assume that all fighting games operate at 60 frames a second, which means that one frame is around 16 milliseconds of real time. And it says, importantly, this isn't just how the game renders new images to your screen. Every frame, the game executes its game loop, which among other things, asks the player's controllers for inputs, it checks the network for new information, runs AI for any CPU players, if you have minions or if you have anything that goes on on there, animates the moves for each character and checks if some someone is now getting hit, right? So after it's done all these things, it draws the results of its calculations to the screen and then does it again 16 milliseconds later. When playing a fighting game offline against your friend, you connect two controllers to one computer or console. If you both happen to press a button within the same 16 millisecond window, the game will receive and process the inputs on the same frame. This is local play, right? This is obviously different when you play on the internet. Information always takes time to send through a network, right? This is measured in ping, the amount of time it takes for information to be sent to the other player and come back. Ping is not just one way. Ping is how long it takes for it to get to you and then how long it takes to get to you and then come back to me. So it says over a connection with 90 ping, for example, it takes 45 MS on average for information to reach the other side, which is about three in game frames which means the game needs to be clever about how they handle the input part of their game loop as they can no longer guarantee button presses for the remote player will line up with the local player. If you press it on one frame and I press it on one frame, how do we sync these up over the internet when there's ping between us? So what this GIF is showing here, right, is that he's hitting this medium punch on frame three. He's hitting medium punch on frame five, 
but because of the three frame delay, it's not reaching until frame eight. You see that? Or he's hitting light punch in this case. You guys, if you've heard anything about rollback, you've probably heard deterministic a few times, right? Which is given identical inputs, every machine that runs the game must produce identical results. So this is cool for non-networking features like replays, right? Because replays, that's how they generally work is when you have a replay, you save the inputs from each player and, and it always reconstructs the match perfectly. We get to avoid sending complicated information about the game state and can save a lot of bandwidth. Games talking to each other directly can often be faster than being forced to talk through an intermediary. And lockstep solutions are particularly good at preventing many types of cheating. For example, even if you've hacked your game so that Ryu can throw faster fireballs, my simulation of the game won't agree with yours and you'll quickly desync. Now that we've gotten through all this, we can get to the meat of the problem. Delay-based netcode, the dreaded word. Uh, the game needs a strategy for how it will deal with these late inputs while keeping the game feeling as close to offline play as possible. The first strategy called delay-based input or input delay is the simplest and most common implementation for games using lockstep networking. If remote players' inputs are arriving late because they need to be sent over the network, delay-based strategies simply artificially delay the local players' inputs by the same amount of time. Then in theory, both inputs will arrive at the same time and can be executed on the same frame as expected. The local player presses a button on frame three. In offline play, we would see this move begin to animate immediately, but instead the game will delay this input by three frames and begin executing the move on frame six. These extra three frames give the necessary time for your opponent's input from frame three to reach you over the internet. On frame six, we have the input from both players and the game can proceed. As long as every input from your opponent can travel the network in these three frames, the game remains stable and consistent. So as you can see here, if both players hit their button on the third frame, which you can see right here, the third frame, they travel over here and they both arrive on frame six. If everything goes according to plan, unfortunately, this is not the reality of the internet. And I wish I could frame this sentence and put it on my wall. While delays are not ideal, there are many players who will not be able to notice small delays in the on the order of two or three frames. For those who can notice it or are training to do an offline tournament where there will be no delay, clever game design and the delay remaining consistent can mitigate the effects of the delay surprisingly well and still allow online play to be a useful method of practice. But the main problem is consistency because networks are notoriously inconsistent. Delay-based strategies struggle because they are terrible at handling network fluctuations. If there's a spike in the connection and some information from your opponent takes a little longer than expected the estimated three frames to reach you, the game simply cannot proceed without the information from both players. It has no choice but to stop and wait for the input or to arrive, causing the game to chug and lurch along during moments of prolonged network trouble. Oh! What? There is a there is a moment where the connection is unstable, and the game begins to chug along. Do you see that? So this shows an example of a big loss in connection, right? You see two A two A, big lag. The game freezes, and now he misses his hit confirm. And the re what's happening here in this case, right, is frame two. He sends this uh, blocking animation. Then there's a big drop. There's three, four, five, six frames where you know there's a big chug and during that moment the game has to stop and say oh god i'm not receiving anything what's happening i haven't received an input in x amount of frames right we have to we got to stop and wait until i hear something there's no controlling this there's no planning for this all that happens is the game is playing there's a loss in connection quality at any point during the match and now the game pauses and chugs. Since pausing the game even briefly is pretty detrimental to a player's experience, most delay-based implementations will try to prevent it from happening as much as they can. By keeping an eye on the network conditions, they can change the amount of delay on the fly to match the connection health. But because the network behavior is very difficult to predict, it will often change too late to avoid having a, a few game pauses, and it will often keep the input delay inflated for longer than expected. Let's say you're playing a connection, and the, the, it's four frame delay. It's not, it's not unplayable four frames, but it's four frames, it's not great. And then for any reason, there's a spike in the connection. What Guilty Gear will do is say, oh shit, right? We don't know what's happening here. We gotta increase the delay. The game doesn't know how long the lag spike is gonna happen. It doesn't know how long you know it should keep it up. So the game just guesses and it increases the delay. It says, oh shit, make it seven frames. Oh shit, it's not enough, 10 frames. Oh, 15, 18 frames. And then let's say by the time it reaches 18 frames, the lag spike's over. At this point, it doesn't matter because the game doesn't know that and it's just panicking and increasing the frame delay to deal with the lag spike. And this could go on for much longer than the lag actually exists. The lag might just be boom, it might happen for an X amount of frames and then it's over, but the game is still trying to recognize, oh shit, maybe it's gonna be longer, maybe this is gonna happen, the game doesn't know what to do. Even when your game will tell you you're playing on three frames, 
sometimes the three frames is not exactly what you even have as your connection, right? Maybe over the time it checks the connection quality, it was three frames at some point, but maybe the majority of the time it's at five frames. There's lots of good examples of bad net code in here. There's so many articles and, and information you can read, right? I mean, this is four different links right here. It's particularly difficult to play delay-based games even just a single time away, let alone trying to unite the player base globally. Delay-based solutions do not care about the game state. Whether the announcer is calling round to fight, your opponent's knocked down, or both players are walking around in neutral, a delay-based game treats connection issues identically in all cases. This means there's no place to hide from a bad connection, even if your opponent's inputs would not impact the match in any way. This is it. I want you guys to read this paragraph over and over and over and over and over again. Delay-based netcode will always see some kind of connection issue and slow the game down and say, whoa, shit, this is bad. Even if inputs have no impact on the game, even if it's when you, the offensive player, is doing a combo on someone else and there's no way for them to escape it, the game will slow down and chug. Even if somebody's whiffed the button, and you want to walk up and whiff punish, and player two is whiffing that button, and there's nothing they can do to change it. I can't, as player one, walk up and whiff punish because the game will stop. Delay-based netcode has no smart way of handling this. It just does what it does. Ultimately, delay-based solutions fail to provide a good user experience because unlike offline play, player inputs are not consistent or responsive. You guys have played delay-based solutions, and you've hit a button, and it's just been lost to the ether, right? or it feels really, really slow or laggy, or you have to change your combo timing and all that kind of stuff. You guys have all had that happen, right? Fighting game players thrive on reproducible and trainable situations that are tied heavily to reactions and reflexes. When input delay fluctuate wildly, whether it's between two different matches or even during the same match, fighting game players lose confidence that anything they would do will work as expected. And when they're unable to enact the exact game plan they would know help them win, online play becomes extremely frustrating and often useless. But what if I have a good connection? This is important to you. People drastically overrate their connection. While it's possible you may have a fast, stable connection to someone near you, it's impossible to control the quality of connections to every potential player. Even if two people near each other with normally fast connections may struggle to maintain a stable connection to each other for reasons uncontrollable by either party. If given a perfect connection with inputs that always sync up, there's no need for any clever strategy to approximate offline play. You're already there. It's the netcode's job to cleverly hide latency. And if your strategy falls apart, even at the slightest sign of network trouble, then it's not an effective method uh, at all. Why is delay-based netcode still used? The main reason that it's uh, popular is that it's simple, right? There's no extra game state processing that needs to occur, which means your game takes roughly the same amount of resources from the computer to run both offline and online. You don't have to plan for it. There's nothing fancy there. It's likely the cheapest, easiest option for developers to do. Unfortunately, it's been mostly Japanese developers who continue to use delay-based approaches, as virtually every fighting game made in America has given up on delay-based netcode and made the switch to rollback. It's not like people playing in Japan are safe from bad connections. Look at Juna go. Oh, I punish? Fuck, you see the lag? You see the lag playing online in Japan and frustrations of bad netcode. Oh, look at one we Majin Obama living we in Japan. Look at the slideshow, the PowerPoint presentation he's trying bar, to man. play on. You see this shit? We only need one bar. We only need one bar. Oh, God. Uh, anyway, let's get into rollback. This is the juice. This is the good shit. Since a game's choice of netcode can never magically change the distance between a player and their opponent or prevent networks from dropping or delaying information, you may wonder how one netcode strategy could be drastically better than the other. The key lies in how the netcode handles uncertainty. Rollback's main strength is that it never waits for missing inputs from the opponent. Instead, Rollback netcode continues to run the game normally, and all inputs from the local player are processed immediately like it was offline. Right, rollback netcode feels like it's offline. All your timing, anti-airing stuff, doing your setups, all of it works correctly, right? Then when the input from the remote player comes in a few frames later, rollback fixes its mistake by correcting the past. It does this in such a clever way that the local player may not even notice a large percentage of network instability. If at any time you're missing inputs, right, any amount of frames, the game will continue to move forward on your screen and everything you push will feel like it's offline. It'll continue going. When they catch up and they receive inputs from your opponents, it will say, okay, well, now that we've received that those inputs from this dead zone, these three frames we missed, what happens in those three frames? Well, it turned out in those three frames that our opponent did nothing. 
right? So it'll simulate the game and say, well, nothing else changed. All right, we'll call it rack up. So it, in one frame, it will receive all the inputs that happened before, run those inputs versus the inputs you sent and determine what actually happened and then play out from there. Sometimes that results in a small teleport. Sometimes that results in nothing. You don't even notice it. In the example below, both the local player and the remote player press pre, uh, medium punch on frame one. But let's say the opponent's input is delayed over the network and reaches us three frames later on frame four. Like offline play, the local player's move immediately begins animating on their screen. On frame four, input from the opponent marked as being pressed on frame one finally arrives. This means what we've shown the player in the last three frames is not really what happened, and the game must fix the pass by performing some calculations in the background. The game logic reruns that situation, says what would have actually happened. So what you see is this. Both characters hit medium punch. That looked normal, right? You couldn't even tell that there was lag. But you can see on frame one, both of them hit it. It's just there was a, a connection quality that made it so that this input didn't receive, get received until fourth frame. And on this fourth frame, when they receive the input, you see this ghostly gray shadow. That's the game refreshing the logic and saying, okay, well, he hit medium punch actually on frame one, and I hit medium punch on frame one. So what would have happened? So what ends up happening is here, you can see on frame one, I hit this. On frame one, he hit this. The game doesn't receive it until frame four. On frame four, the game rewinds, and on the fourth frame, it replays both of them hitting medium punch. Says, hmm, and you just see the medium punch. So look at this. Watch this GIF again from the beginning. This is what you see. This is lag right here. Does that look like lag to you? The game dropped like three frames. That's 30% speed, by the way. Do you see lag here? The game fixes it in one frame. It just looks like this. Let's watch lag one more time. Let's watch lag. It's incredible. The local player does not ever see the game perform these steps individually. Instead, all they see is the game state they thought was correct, but was wrong, get immediately replaced with the actual correct game state. Oh, this is so cool. This is lag right here. These are one frame, two frame, and three frames of rollback that you're watching. So zero frame rollback, it looks normal. One frame of rollback, two frames of rollback, and three frames of rollback. You can hardly even tell. This is three frames of rollback at 30% speed, and you can hardly even tell. Somebody says, what happens if it's like seven frames, or nine frames, or 10 frames? First of all, that's a huge drop. <laughs> On a delay-based solution, the game freezes. On a rollback solution, the rollback's like, oh shit, now hold up. How much is 10 frames of rollback in ping? It's like huge, right? 300 ping, someone says, 320 MS. I, there is actually a cap with the amount of ping that a game will accept before it just cuts off. MKX will disconnect you if you ever roll back eight frames or more. It says the connection is too bad. We cannot handle an eight frame rollback, that is too much. You shouldn't play this match, disconnect. To put it in another way, rollback allows each client to temporarily break the lockstep model. The game may be showing slightly different things to each player and depending on the connection quality and what's happening on the time of the rollbacks. However, the game will always correct itself to be the same for both players whenever the inputs have been received a few frames later. The local player's inputs are always shown immediately and can never be undone, right? If you press a button on frame four, that information is immediately processed by your game and your move will instantly always coming out on the frame that you hit it, right? So there is no way that your input can be invalidated or eaten by network lag. You know when you hit like something into 6P with soul and you do jump dust and you just like, uh, uh, and you just miss and they fall down and the button is just gone, you don't know where it happened? That won't happen in this case. Therefore, a player can feel confident that the buttons they press will be executed regardless of the network quality, greatly enhancing the consistency of online play. As an added bonus, when the game encounters network trouble, there will only ever be rollbacks in the immediate time around the spike. Rollback is particularly great for lossy connections like Wi-Fi for this reason. This is the core concept of rollback, not even the whole thing, this is just the core concept, but you can do better. The basics of prediction. In the example above, when the input was missing from the remote player, we simply assumed they were inputting nothing so the game had nothing, to, something to simulate. This is a pretty bad assumption in general because players are rarely doing nothing. And the visual states shown to the players right before a rollback would almost always be wildly incorrect. It turns out we can predict what the opponent is doing with an uncanny degree of accuracy. When inputs are missing, what rollback solutions actually do is duplicate the last known input from the remote player for the current missing frames. So anytime there's a drop in connection, 
If they were holding forward, they're still holding forward. If they're holding down back, the game predicts that they will continue to hold down back. If they're holding a button, the game assumes they are probably still holding that button. The game then runs with the predicted inputs for the remote player instead, while the connection drop happens. Keeping the example videos as easy to understand as possible will temporarily assume that the network transmission time is instant, and wherever there are missing frames, it's because the network got briefly overloaded. Let's say Fulgore st starts to walk forward, and two th frames, three frames, fourth frame of him walking forward, there's a drop in the connection. The fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth frames, the game is just assuming, well, we've missed all these frames. We're just gonna assume he was doing exactly what he was doing before the lag came in. Before we lost these frames that he was holding forward, before he stopped, well, let's just assume he's still holding forward. When the actual correct remote inputs arrive a few frames later, the game needs to decide how to use them. If the inputs were incorrect, they perform a rollback, which is when you see some kind of shifting in what's happening. If these inputs are exactly as predicted, no rollback needs to happen. The game that was shown to the player during the prediction period was correct, and the game simply updates what it knows to be the last correct input frame from the remote player, and the local player doesn't know anything went wrong. When the game correctly predicts the inputs, rollback ensures the game feels perfect, and even if there was network delay. So let's say that for this fourth frame, this fifth frame, this sixth frame, the seventh frame, you know, we don't know what happened. And then it's, oh, it turns out during this rollback that every frame he was holding forward. Great. So he was still holding forward. There was a f one, two, three, four, five frame drop, and it just looks like he's walking forward. This is what lag looks like. This is lag. That's five frames of lag. Prediction is a relatively basic addition to the paradigm, but it has a huge impact. It does a lot more to hide the effects of bad connections than you might initially think. The rollback's version of prediction is not as advanced as you might expect if you play other genres like first person shooters. As stated, all it really does is assume the remote player has not changed their inputs. It doesn't guess inputs by inputting new things. It just assumes you're doing exactly what you're doing before the lag. As it turns out, this is an extremely reasonable assumption if you break down how often players can actually change their inputs. Consider it in a match like Street Fighter-like game where players are walking back and forth. Let's assume a player changes their walking direction around five times a second, which is a good ballpark even for especially active players. This means we would actually only need inputs from the remote player on five out of the 60 frames in a given second, a staggeringly low 8% of the time. The player's inputs for the other 55 frames can be predicted with a high degree of accuracy just by assuming they're doing the exact same thing they were doing before. Which is like, if you're only getting 8% of a frame's inputs, that's a shit ton of lag. <laughs> if you have knocked down your opponent or you're trying to pressure them, it's not uncommon for a defensive player to simply hold down back for 30, 60, or 120 consecutive frames. Why do we need to wait for the network to tell us this if the frame-by-frame -frame prediction that your opponent will continue to hold down back or continue not to press a button is correct 95% of the time? What this means is that if there's a network spike during any of those moments, at any moment at all, there's a network uh, spike. Instead of the game freezing or instead of the game chugging or anything like that, like we saw in the delay base examples, if the remote input is in unchanged, where they did exactly what the game thought, when there's two frames of lag, when there's three frames of lag, it is completely invisible to both players. You can't tell. When you play good rollback netcode, when there's lag, you don't even know there's lag. The only times you're seeing visible rollbacks is the rare occurrence where there's big drops in lag from a connection that's relatively unstable. The thing is, as you say, this doesn't work for anime players who will press approximately 5,000 buttons during those 45 frames. There's an example on the next in the next section that tells you that that's actually, it doesn't matter. It, it can handle that too. How is there more? Unlike delay-based solutions, which could have problems anytime during a match, rollback approaches only show a visual change if the new inputs from the remote player have changed the game state. Here, your remote input playing Jago whiffs a heavy punch on frame two. Right after I whiff this heavy punch, there's a huge network spike and all the information for the next five frames. Five frames where you don't get any information from your opponent does not arrive on time. Rollback doesn't care. It will continue to simulate the game anyway. In this case, it will assume Jago inputs nothing as they had released their finger off the heavy bunch button on the last known frame so look on frame one he hits heavy bunch on frame four we start to lose these buttons frame five frame six frame seven frame eight finally everything comes through and we learn he hit light punch forward and heavy kick during the fierce but and then block but does it matter he's whiffing a fierce this is what it looks like in lag that's lag right there on that fierce there's a light punch, light punch, heavy kick. Like, there's all this shit in here. 
but it doesn't matter because he's hitting a fierce. Because the opponent was whiffing a move, the game's rules say that they aren't allowed to control their character right now. The new inputs have changed nothing about the game state. Even though the game rolled back and re-simulated multiple frames, the end result was the same as showed by the screen. The lag is completely invisible. The important part here is this. Even if this guy input 96 things in those five frames where we just lost connection entirely, it doesn't matter. And in the delay-based solution, the game would slow down during that fierce and there'd be lag and you'd be horrible. But in rollback, the fierce just plays. And if you're that full gore and you want to walk up and whiff punish him, there's nothing stopping you. Think about all the times during a match that your opponent's inputs can't change the game state. This varies by game, but usually includes time when they're knocked down, being comboed, in block stun, where any move is starting up, recovering or whiffing, and many others. There are obviously uh, change, times where this can be affected, right? If you hit someone in Guilty Gear, the burst is available. But in lots of games, there's a ton of time where you have nothing you can do. As long as the game has correctly registered the beginning of these actions, you are completely immune to lag until the opponent can change the game state again. The connection problems haven't gone away, uh, but rollback solutions do the best job of simply ignoring them as often as you can. And the, they can even make the laggiest connections feel extremely playable. In Killer Instinct's case, it even allows online sets to be played between Singapore and the eastern U.S. Over connections that approach 200 MS ping, which would be unbearable with delay-based netcode. Into level 3, let's go! That's as sick as a cog, yeah, FC, dropping the big sub, thanks very much. 200 MS. Blocks the uppercut and punishes it. Doesn't have to change his combo timing. Medium auto doubles. Breaks medium auto doubles on the internet. I mean, obviously, there's some rollbacks in that connection, right? That That's 200 MS. But it's a playable connection. 200 MS and playable. What wizardry is this? Modern fighting games. Can we split the difference? In real world sim situation, inputs always take time to send over the network, which means every input will always arrive after the frame it was intended for. This means every single button press or change of direction your opponent does will always cause at least a slight rollback as long as the input changes the state. Turns out we can eliminate this by combining delay-based rollback and rollback solutions. In fact, every modern fighting game that uses rollback is built on a delay-based framework. With the important caveat that the delay is fixed at the start and never changes. Remember when we talked about this when people say, I play delay-based solutions and it's always fine with everybody. Why would I want rollback? And I say, if it's actually the case that you play delay-based uh, fighting games online and you never have any issues, rollback would not change your experience. If it's true that somehow you play on delay-based solutions and there's never an issue, ever. The internet is always completely stable, impossible, but... Even if it, that's the case, rollback at its core is built on top of a delay-based solution. If there are network spikes, rather than increasing input delay, which causes the game to freeze and chug and all that stuff, or pausing and waiting, rollback then takes over for any input longer than that chosen delay. Right? So it's a delay-based solution, and if shit gets bad, it uses rollback, which handles lag better. As long as the delay is small and consistent, players will quickly adapt and many will never notice a difference from offline play. Rollback is the best solution we have for hiding lag in fighting games, but now it's time to talk about what it takes to get rollback netcode into a fighting game. You know, a lot of people say rollback is awesome and they wish they would have it more and et cetera, et cetera, but there are technical limitations and there are reasons why it's not in every game. And this article does, uh, you know, justice to discussing it. And here's a list of the things you need to deal with when uniquely, when supporting rollbacks versus delay bases. All the things you need to add to make your game and make sure it's great. The primary requirement of a rollback game is that it can save and load different game states and simulate game logic in the background while the game is running. The act of converting objects and computer memory to a format that can be saved and loaded is called serialization. And the game state for every single frame must be serial and saved in case we need to roll it back later. It must be lightning fast. You have to be able to do this in that frame, right? And depending on how the game has been built, you may even need to change how the data is stored and how the various systems of your game use it to gain the necessary performance. If you build your game with rollback in mind from the start, it can lessen the burden, but adding rollback to an existing game can mean a lot of system-wide changes to the very core of your game. Game logic must be independent from everything else in your gameplay loop. All right, we talked about gameplay loops in the beginning. 
and you need to be able to run many frames of logic without rendering to the screen. So it needs to happen in the background. You can't see that this rollback is happening and redoing anything, right? And depending on the engine you choose or how much customization to the engine provided game loops you've done, separating and turning off these subsystems may be surprisingly hard. Perhaps those costly CPU cycles that your fancy particle sister, uh, system or cloth simulation uses are now putting you over your performance budget. Or maybe you've been playing fast and loose with your console's power because the need to be extremely efficient wasn't there when you initially built the game. This is why when people say you need to do rollback from the start, they mean you need to do it from the start. Retrofitting it is very tough. NRS was able to do it, right? But retrofitting it is a lot of work. And this is probably one of the few companies that's able to do that. Like I'm able to thank Zero for dropping the big two months. Thanks very much. To dispel a common myth about rollback, there are no limitations based on the genre of game. Rollback could be and has been used for 2D or 3D fighting games alike, including Street Fighter 3, Third Strike, Killer Instinct, Brawlhall, and For Honor. It's also used outside of fighting games. Iron Galaxy incorporated rollback netcode into Dungeons and Dragons, Chronicles of Mysteria, hell yeah, D&D. Even games like Rocket League incorporate rollback when other GDC talk. All netcode solutions, whether driven by input delay or rollbacks, must keep both systems running completely in sync. This means both systems are shown each player the same frame at the same time or as close as possible. It is not simply enough to sync at the beginning of a match and assume all players will remain in sync the whole time. Many issues outside of networking, such as consoles overheating or something temporarily overloading the CPU, can cause performance drops, which will put them out of sync in your opponent. All tabbing in Street Fighter V against PS4 players is an example, yes. The consequences of not correcting the sync are catastrophic, aka one sided rollbacks. This clip might look slightly familiar, and the names may be blurred out, but I'd recognize that Ryu player's handsome hair at any moment in time. This is what an extremely one-sided rollback might look like for one unlucky player. The other side sees a much more normal version of the same match. My roommate, he, he said it looked fine. Playing in these conditions is impossible. Only the player who is ahead of the other will experience the effects of the bad connection. Solving the problem is relatively straightforward. Most rollback systems will briefly pause the player who is ahead for one or two frames so the player who is behind can catch up. The game keeps on top of this system and never lets the game drift very far apart, and losing one frame of every 10 seconds to maintain the sync is unnoticeable to even the most astute players. So what exactly is GGPO? You've often heard GGPO and rollback used interchangeably among fighting game fans. The main function of GGPO is to provide a robust solution for syncing machines and game states. For example, GGPO can tell your game uh, when two machines are out of sync and how, by how much. And it can keep track of the inputs from all connected parties and tell your game when to roll back and by how much. It is an excellent asset towards making games that want to use rollback netcode. However, the act of actually performing the rollback still falls on the developer. They have to make sure the game is performant, their game logic is properly split away from other parts of the game loop, and all the edge cases are handled intelligently. GGPL simply tells them when and why to roll back and what new inputs you should simulate your game with. It does not concern itself with a particular implementation of how the game achieves these goals. That's where the developer has to do the work, right? Be careful of the edge cases. This is another example of where a rollback can go wrong. And this big one is creating and destroying objects. It talks about remote inputs coming in and a fireball that was blocked. So the fireball is destroyed. Instead, what happened is the player used an EX move to go through it. Now that fireball is not destroyed. It has to be recreated on the screen, on the screen, which means you have to save that object in the game and be able to recreate the object on the screen. Particle systems all also require a lot of special attention. Audio is also particularly difficult. This is another one. You have to be very careful to correctly copy the last known frame during your prediction algorithm. This includes what direction the remote player was holding as well as the buttons they were holding and not holding. If you mess up this prediction, you may cause a remote player to do something they never actually did. In this case, in Street Fighter V, the rollback assumes he let go of the zonk because he's no longer holding these buttons. But in reality, he's up in the air. So the zonk starts up, but he never actually did a zonk. He jumped. Is rollback worth the effort? The final, uh, what's it called? Discussion. While there's no denying that adding rollback to a game takes effort and expense, I don't want the takeaway from this section to feel that implementing rollback is too difficult. It largely depends on when you decide to implement a rollback. Adding rollback to a game after its gameplay systems have been built is very challenging. When NRS decided to patch in rollback to Mortal Kombat X, it took approximately 8 man years of time split between many programmers over 10 months. 
On the other side of the spectrum, Mike Z, lead programmer on Schoolgirls, added GGPO to his game in about two weeks, early in development using his custom engine, likely well planned out for rollbacks. And then there are some examples of adding benefits to the other areas of your game when you have rollbacks, right? If you have a robust uh, method for saving and loading game states, you can add that to your training mode to increase the options there. And once you've done it one time, you've done rollback correctly once, then you can reap the benefit and use it in future games, right? Like MKX going to Injustice 2, going into Mortal Kombat 11. In reality, uh, rollback netcode is far from the first worthwhile advancement in technology to be more work than the previous method. The value for rollback is there, and developers should be not be wary of prioritizing that benefit in their game. After all, is there anything more important for a modern fighting game than smooth, reliable, consistent online play that can connect communities worldwide? And this is an interview with Ramon and Keats from Iron Galaxy. Obviously, these two worked on Killer Instinct's uh, rollback netcode, and they've worked on rollback for quite a few titles. They talked about how Iron Galaxy has put uh, rollback in a bunch of different games, right? What was your first experience with rollback in online fighting games? Right? What was your first experience chat room of rollback? Ramon says, as an online engineer on all of Iron Galaxy's fighting games, I first experienced rollback in Third Strike Online Edition. I didn't really know it was a thing until then. And Keith says, for me, it was way back in the old school days of the Capcom IRC channel. Tony Cannon, founder of GGPO, was a co-owner of the channel, and he offered some people the chance to try out this closed beta using Alpha 2 as a test game. The experience was so good. After years of tolerating bad online experience in the early days of Xbox Live, I thought for the first time that the FGC was saved and that online, the online future was possible. He thought the future was now. The future is not even now. The future is still the future. How would you assess how difficult it is to include rollback in fighting games? It's definitely more work than delay-based to implement rollback. You have to solve the delay-based part first. I can take any rollback game I've ever worked on and turn off the prediction frames and rollback algorithm, and you now have a delay-based game. Anytime a new element is added to the game, it has the possibility of affecting your game state and making it so rollbacks can cause a desync. There's no getting around that. When Keats comes up to me and says, hey, I want these projectiles to be random, and sometimes four of them come out and they loop around in odd patterns. That's Omen's projectiles. These are now elements I have to make sure can be rolled back, including adding new elements to the code. I can train programmers to make sure their variables are registered with our rollback system, but it's unavoidably more work. Even non-programmers like the QA team now need to incorporate rollbacks in their testing. For example, with Killer Instinct, our QA team tested with 20% packet loss at 150 MS of latency always turned on. You should throw your router to the nearest garbage if you're having that kind of packet loss, but we made sure KI could play acceptably well at that rate. <laughs> Performance of these things in many kind is a big deal. That thing you could have done in 16 MS without even thinking twice now fits uh, needs to fit into one MS if you simulate it 10 frames into a single frame, right? So you have to be clever here. Despite it being more work, all these things have solutions and good rollback games do them. My opinion is still that it's super worthwhile in the investment. All right, somebody who's a professional. This is probably one of the lead minds of how rollback works and how to do rollback correctly. There are some games that let you choose the input delay before rollback kicks in, while other games hide that option from the user and always choose the same delay. What's your take on these two options? Killer Instinct is one of those games that doesn't let you choose. It always adds three frames of delay. It gives us 45 MS for the input to get to the other side, so 90 ping. So if you play anybody and it's less than 90 MS, rollback, not an issue, unless the connection quality dips. In some of the early rollback games Iron Galaxy did, we let users set the delay, and this would, of course, means that people would automatically set the delay to zero, because zero is a dope number, and you think that, okay, my internet can handle zero MS. That means that every time you press the button, the other user would experience a rollback. Because at zero frames with proper time sync, when the other user gets your input, it's always in the past. But as a whole, the studio has to think about the connection quality for the average player. Three frames of rollback every time you press a button can be a little challenging for the non-rollback aware consumer. If you're not going to let the user choose the delay, would it ever be desirable or possible to set the game to detect the connection quality then automatically lower the delay? Having something that decides one frame of delay at the beginning of the match means that halfway through the match, you can all of a sudden be playing at a higher latency and the delay won't adjust. Then you'd end up with significantly more rollbacks and changing the input latency on the fly is what we're trying to avoid from the delay-based approaches. I also think it's not entirely clear whether playing 10% of your matches at two frames of delay, but 90% of your matches at three frames of delay is even that valuable. I think consistency is the more important part, and I, I think that's probably true, yeah. I think that the number of opponents you can play at one to two frames of delay and have it be steady is very tiny. 
even people who just live 30 minutes away from you often can't maintain that good of a connection with you. So I think the people who say in delay based games, I get to play a one frame of delay, but I'll never get to play a three below three in rollback games are being a bit dishonest. And I'm not dishonest when I say Galactic, AKA Robbie is very kind of dropping the Twitch Prime. Thanks very much. Seems like a good time to branch into how the designer can make smart design choices knowing you are building for a rollback game. I'm sure you've thought about this quite a bit, Keats. And he says, maybe the first point to talk about would be the startup of moves. Because rollbacks happen only around your opponent's button presses, it means when a rollback occurs, it can always cuts off start of the, some of the startup. Having moves with slower startup makes it easier to hide rollbacks. Killer Instinct's fast as normal hits on the fifth frame, and the speed of the game doesn't suffer for it. The typical Tekken jab is 10 frame startup, which I think makes Tekken a great candidate for rollback. Divekick is another example of this. We implemented GGPO very well in that game, but I didn't know how to design the game with rollbacks in mind. So the startup of all jumps and all dive kicks is instant. There's no pre-jump or anything. So the teleporting can get a little wild in that game with the faster characters. If I had just added two or three frames to the startup of jumps and dive kicks, the game would feel and play mostly the same, but look vastly better online. One of the things people don't like about rollback is when a move looks like a hit, but the rolls it rolls back into being blocked and you get yourself killed. Firstly, I should say that a game with extremely tight hit confirms like this would play extremely poorly in delay-based netcode. But you can design your game such that hit confirms right on the edge of offline human reaction into a minus 20 or block move aren't required to play the game. Slightly bigger cancel windows, how safe certain special moves are, how much damage you can get off of these confirms, and how good your defensive options are. With smart design choices, rollback can work for whatever kind of game you're building. Why do you think fighting games are always peer-to-peer -peer and never a client-server architecture like so many other games? Does rollback not play well with the server-based system? Should fighting games switch? I think the main two reasons are latency and cost. Direct peer-to-peer -peer connections means your message gets to the other client directly rather than routing through a server. And you also don't have to pay costs to keep a server up and running. As for why we do lockstep as opposed to server client topology, I think either is possible in theory, but it's been my experience that lockstep works nicely for fighting games because the only variable is player input. In a server client system where you're sending stuff to a server and it's going back and forth like that, uh, when you see my character, you are seeing a ghost of my character's past instead of waiting for inputs to be sure we are synced. I do something, then the server finds out, and then it sends it to you. It's not actually synced up directly. This would feel really frustrating to play. And if you wanted to make server client work for a fighting game, you'd have to do a lot of weird stuff to build the whole game around this limitations. Ricky in filament in the chat says, one thing that's important about it is, I think you should probably not design a game that is only playable offline and terrible online. But I also think you, sh you should need to sacrifice your design vision to include rollbacks. And the reason we don't know what is better or worse is because how many companies are actually taking the steps to do rollback? Not many. And if lots were, then there could be a discussion between designers about what to do, how to improve stuff, etc. But because nobody wants to do it besides Western companies, we're only seeing the discussion from Western devs on how to design fighting games better so that they play well online. Should we try to improve our prediction model? Should we try to predict that they did forward and then, oh, they're going to walk back or they're going to, should we try that? And he says, I've thought about this a bunch. Fighting games in general are pretty great in that. More often than not, you are pressing or not pressing the same button you pressed the frame before. And he says, I would also imagine you'd be wrong considerably more often than right if you went with the approach of actually trying to guess the end result of it before it happens. And I think a solution that mispredicts with a rate of even 10% and then has to roll back would feel so much worse than the current prediction model. Is the model robust for adding more players? <laughs> Rollback can work fine with more than two players. Iron Galaxy actually shipped the port of a four-player dungeon crawler that uses GPO and it works fantastic. As you would expect, with more players, you'll have more opportunities to roll back and you'll have to send more data across the network. Eventually, you might hit a limit where there are too many players and the bandwidth hit is too big, but the limit is definitely not two players. You could have more than two. Final thoughts. Do you have some general thoughts on rollback and its use in general? It's funny because when I first saw rollbacks in action, my reaction was, duh, why isn't everyone using this? And then when Iron Galaxy first did it, my uh, in Third Strike, I was like, wow, this is just magic and it works. We've been doing delay-based lockstep networking architecture for 25 years. Quake came out and we switched to a server client architecture where the server tells everyone what they should be seeing, where everyone interpolates in order to make it look smooth. When this happened, lockstep networking kind of stopped evolving. It's my opinion that rollback is the next step for lockstep networking. Keith says, I don't think there's anything more valuable to online fighting games than good netcode. So to me, it's a no-brainer that devs should prioritize rollback in their development. 
You need to change a bit how your game is built since you now need to manage your game state differently and be able to both load it and simulate it very fast. But the end result is going to be able to confidently tell your fans that they can enjoy your game coast to coast and even able to play most matches overseas. If the confidence that you could say you can run online tournaments and they won't be a joke, the results will still be valid. So this is really cool. And this is a big interview. I don't, I can't think of anything like this with an interview with developers who are so familiar with rollback netcode and long form discussing designing a game around rollback netcode working with rollback netcode how it could improve this is fucking sick this is great now this next part i don't know if we should read all this there's some dweeb here discussing rollback netcode and you know you guys have already heard me talk about rollback netcode until the end of time look at that little dweeb's face right there i'm here this is my twitter my twitch and my youtube and i did a little interview in this the goat article on fighting game netcode this is an article written by infilament who wrote the ki guide who wanted to write an article to explain to people how netcode works because every time i talk about netcode on my stream these motherfuckers come in and make some shit up so i was like talking to ricky about it and being like man it's so hard because every day it's like I can't point them to a good resource that'll explain how netcode works, and I can't tell them to shut the fuck up. They just have to take my word for it. So instead of taking my word for it, who gives a fuck about Sagem? Fuck that guy, Sagem. I don't even like him. Just go read about it. Just go read this article, right? This article is well-cited and written by an academic and easy to get through. And while you're at it, click on the PayPal article, or click on the PayPal button and send Ricky some money for writing that article out of the fucking kindness of his own heart netcode owns and owes in filament 200 bucks yeah it does everybody owns in filament 200 bucks he's done the lord's work 